clear why he is uh, known that way. No one uses or speaks of the agape, the, the love of God in such a, a short amount of space as the gospel of John. And, uh, John is pouring out his heart, his heartfelt concern for the welfare of this church, those that he knows well, followers of Christ. We know that they and the apostle um, were targets of, of opposition against the church, and yet he still calls for unity. He still calls them to, to love always, even in the midst of opposition. And so it is the, the Christian community that needs to uh, embody that same proactive love that God extends in Christ. And some of these verses we're going to read this morning, beginning at verse 7 of chapter 4, are likely very familiar to you. I won't sing them for you, but uh, I trust they will resonate um, in our hearts as we read them again together. So 1 John 4, beginning at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God, must also love his brother. This is God's holy and enduring word. Would you pray with me? Lord God, you are love. We pray that the love you had for us would only grow within us. And that you would help us now as we consider these great words that you have given, words meant to comfort and assure us, and to show us how to walk in faithful obedience and love to you. Holy Spirit, we ask your help now. Make us attentive. Work your word in our hearts that it would not only deepen in its roots, but bear much fruit in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What is love? I almost sang that part. Um, Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. I don't know why you're not there. I give you my love, but you don't care. So what is right? What is wrong? Give me a sign. What is love? I know some of you are holding back. Um, But it's a question of of, um, music almost in every genre. What is love? And it's an important question um, for us to uh, consider this morning. It's a question in all societies the world over because it identifies a fundamental human need Um, the question of love we need love we want love we have been created to love we want to know how to love we want to know want to know that we are loved Uh, in in this in this country mid-february we have a national holiday that helps, I guess I'll say, feed our love to be loved. You know, love is chocolates, or love is a bouquet of flowers, or love is the teddy bear, or a nice note. And, and these things are fun ways to, to show our affection, um, help boost the economy around Valentine's Day as well. Uh, but do they really help in answering that question, what is love? 
I think maybe if we turn to the scientists, they should know. Let, let's ask them. Maybe, maybe science can help us with this question. One scientist claims, love is a kind of temporary insanity driven by home hormones. Um, so maybe, maybe it's the temporary insanity part that why, why so many of us have been hurt by love, felt rejected, maybe feel unloved. We think of our, the time in which we live, our society, both in and out of the church. We, we, we live in the loneliest time we have ever lived. Um, even with all of the advances in technology. In fact, this technology actually encourages this type of solidarity and isolation. You say, well, I can, it's actually quite manageable. But our hearts long to be loved love and in close relationships where we share life together. That's what we long for. And John tells us in this letter that we're children of God. We've been purchased back into the family of God through the sacrifice of Christ and we need to love as an indication, a proof that we really believe that we've been loved in this great way. But it's hard for us. It's hard for us to love. We don't know how to, some of the reasons I, I just mentioned. We, we don't believe in the love that's been given to us in Christ. Sometimes we love because we're afraid, really afraid to love. We fear what love might look like under certain circumstances, don't we? What, what it might cost us to love. We fear having to love well because maybe of what another person will think of us, reputation, Maybe we're, we're, we're afraid that we're going to fail at our attempts of love. And so much of this grounded in the response of what, uh, what others think of us, how others are, are viewing us, and yet not in the strength and hope that we have in the gospel because a love firmly planted in the gospel really has nothing to fear. So it's not, not a way that, that we're used to thinking about love, certainly not a way that I'm used to thinking about it. Uh, but John shares with us here love's Love's source, where it comes from, what it is, and love's assurance. How we can be confident in our loving now and at the day of Christ's return. So we're going to look at both of those uh, aspects, love's source and love's uh, assurance here together. In the opening verses, John, John reminds us that love not only comes from God, but that God is love. He is the source of of love. There is no trait more inherent in the Godhead than the active will to love. God loves within his own being, Father loving the Son, the Son loving the Father and the Spirit. It's the very nature of God to love. We read the words of, of Jesus' prayer as he offers them to the Father in John's Gospel in chapter 17. As he prays for those who who believe this gospel, that they would be united to him and the love that he has with the Father. Let me read just a portion here. He prays, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Love has its source in the personal creator God. Now, John doesn't say, John doesn't say love is God because that would be replacing the personal living God with some type of uh, abstraction, either an ethical or, or emotional abstraction. You hear the difference? I'm not, I'm feeling love, so this must be the presence of God. Well, you hear the problem with that? And we start to, to long after and chase for that abstraction rather than the personal living God. And so we begin to reframe the question here. We started with, what is love? And instead of asking, what is love? The scriptures answer, first and foremost, who is love? Where does love have its origin? Where do we go to find it? We go to love's source, from God himself. And it is love from the source that's communicated to us in the gospel Verse 10, we, we see it again in verse 19, uh, verse 14. Um, if God were not love, then we would have no hope, no expectation of, of mercy. 
no forgiveness. But because God is love, He takes the initiative. He always makes that first move. God always loves first in covenant relationship with His people. He sent His Son to take that that guilt, sin upon Himself. In no way could we earn or deserve such love. God gives this willingly, freely to us. Church, we need to consider that we are are weaker and more sin-scarred than we could possibly imagine. But in Jesus, more loved, more accepted than we ever dared hope. Jesus is the the eternal incarnation of the love of God. He lived, died, took his life up again for us. That's what enables us to live and love each other well. John Calvin, you know the name, French reformer says, there is no more livelier argument to love than this. We love one another because God has loved us. This is the gospel response. It must be preached to ourselves over and over and over again. I love because he loved me. I love because he loves me. The bigger we see the cross of Christ and our need for that cross, the more we're able to love each other. Because we are just as undeserving as the ones that we are attempting to love, are we not? And so our love for one another, particularly here within the body of Christ, it should be a reflection of God's love in the gospel. We love as Christ loved us and others see Jesus with greater clarity in us. I think this is the greatest apologetic in our community. We are talking about this this morning in Sunday school. People want to see Jesus. They should be able to meet him here in his church, among his people. It should be one of the most powerful magnets in attracting those outside the community to faith. Um, What what does this love look like? Well, it means we're patient with one another within the body of Christ. I've read the story of Jim and Linda. They were married for, have been married for 60 years, and they were were coming home one afternoon, pulled into the garage of their apartment, and uh, Linda was starting to suffer from Alzheimer's and she would go back to this place of her childhood, uh, lost her mother when she was a teenager. And so she kept uh, kept crying out to to Jim, take me home, take me home, because she needed to keep the lights on and have supper ready for her father. And Jim sat next to her, put his hand on her shoulder and said, honey, we are home. Uh, You're married to me to Jim this is our apartment we have a son she kept crying out no no take me home and a while later their son came into the garage and said how long have have you two been in here and Jim said oh about two hours you see Jim was learning the patience of love are we able to at least try to be patient with one another Loving one another also means that we hope together. Uh, We hope for the the unity and and preservation of the church. We hope all things uh, for each other. And that's, again, not wishful thinking. Uh, This is the assurance of victory we have in Jesus over all the hurts, all that, that, that kills and destroys in this world. We hope together. It will not always be. Love means not insisting on our own way, maybe maybe the way things have always been done, but praying, Lord, your will be done in my life, in the life of your church. Love means we don't nurse grudges or have any appetite for revenge. Love never desires us to settle that score, but to forgive, seek forgiveness because we've been forgiven so much. So these are some of the faces of love, love that's grounded in the love of God, communicated in the gospel. But the apostle also gives an assurance, assurance that comes with this kind of, of love that's being perfected in us. He says this assurance comes from the witness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It comes from the apostles, their witness, as well as the witness of perfect love. So I'll elaborate on each of those. In verse 13, it says, God has given us of his spirit and the testimony of the Holy Spirit within us provides us knowledge and assurance of the abiding love of God. It's the living God and the presence of the Spirit that produces that character in us. 
Uh, maybe you've seen that Pixar film, The Incredibles. It's been out now for a little while. We bought a family, and this, uh, every member of this family has superpowers. And Mr. Incredible has, you know, strength uh, like nothing else. And Mrs. Incredible, who's also Elastigirl, her body can stretch and, um, in so many different ways. And then the kids each have a gift. But because uh, superheroes have been sued by an ungrateful population, they need to uh, suppress their gifts. They're not supposed to use them. And so they tell their children, you know, you can't, you can't use uh, your gifts all until Mr. Incredible gets in trouble. And then Mrs. Incredible, after the kids, they, they go in uh, to the rescue and, and Mrs. Incredible tells the kids that when the bad guys come, to use their powers. Run as fast as you can and use your ability to turn invisible. And so we watch them towards the end of the film just sort of come into their own and discover the full potential of the power they've been given, a power that, that changes them. And so when the believer responds in love and moves towards one another, when everything in us would rather ignore, reject, be angry, there, there's real evidence of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, a power that is changing us. And it's the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit that unites us with Christ and with one another. So we're growing into that. We've also been given the witness of, of the apostles, John says. These are the ones who have seen, uh, can testify that Jesus is the Son of God, that he has died and rose uh, for those he came to save. The apostles have a, a unique uh, responsibility in sharing what it is they have seen and heard. In fact, in the New Testament, the test of apostleship was that they had to see, be commissioned by the Lord himself. Peter says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. We made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So we can have a deep assurance, not only the truth of the gospel, but of our own union with the Lord Jesus as we believe and confess the apostolic witness. The love's assurance through the apostolic message, the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives but also through the perfect love of Christ. A love that drives out fear. The, the, the coming of divine judgment, uh, punishment for evil, that was a common understanding uh, in the early church. There was an expectation that God would return to judge all men. An expectation that uh, certainly is not as prevalent uh, today. I can, I can remember talking with a gentleman outside of church one morning, and we were talking about why there seems to be so few you know, younger people uh, in the church in our time. We were sharing you know, different ideas as to why that, that may be the case. But I think what's magnified here in our passage is, is a big one. Any thought that we might be accountable to God for our every thought, our every word and action, that He will one day pass judgment as the supreme, holy creator of the universe, that, that idea is wholeheartedly suppressed in our time. Because that would, well, that would limit our freedom, right? That, that would be very un-American. And so it goes, to justify the worship of ourselves in created things. So John calls his readers here, be free from a life of fear or impending punishment because love has united them to Christ. And those who were opposing John, leaving the church, and we don't know exactly what kind of threats they may have been making, but it could have been along the lines of, you, you need to follow us or else. Get out of that or else. That, that, that fear is already a penalty, isn't it? The fear of impending punishment. Maybe as a child you heard those words, wait till your father comes home. Maybe, you're, maybe you use those words now as a parent or grandparent, just, just wait so dad comes home, and so now, whoo, um, that strikes fear in the hearts of most children. Um, and they may be more obedient than they have been all afternoon. But John says, no, no, there is no fear of impending punishment. Jesus died so we could live without a fear of punishment in the future, but without fear of guilt and shame now in the present. See, if we are always living, always obeying the rules 
afraid of what our Heavenly Father might do to us, then we truly do not not love Him. We're not believing that He truly loves us. Our Father loves us perfectly in Jesus. And any assurance that we have right now in the present, any assurance for the future is not dependent on our ability to love, but on Jesus' ability to love. It's His love that gives us assurance. His love embodied and lived out that gives us confidence. So I hope we begin to see just how freeing this is in the life of the Christian. It frees us to risk loving well. So in this gospel, it actually frees us to take the risks, loving one another, take, taking risks where normally it would just be a fear of failure. Family, Lord Jesus has robed us with the perfection of his obedient life, which means we are free to fail. Free to fail because Jesus has not, cannot fail. So any attention that you desire, approval that you desire, that your heart craves, the success, the control, all that's already ours in Jesus. So we can take the risk of loving well. Because we have all the purity and the perfection of Jesus' love abiding in us now. So, what is love? More than just a sign, it is the Son who offered Himself in love so that we could love freely. See, love is only possible because God has loved us in the first place. He's the source. He's given, given us the assurance that drives out fear in the perfect love of Jesus. That's what enables us. So as the reflection of our Creator, who is love, we can love one another without fear. We can love one another with gratitude. Let's pray together. Lord God, we praise you as the God of love who has poured out your love for us in Christ. Lord, forgive us when we walk in fear believing that we are yet orphans and not fully loved of you. Lord, as we've been reminded in our worship this morning, there is nothing that can separate us from your love. Because you've taken the initiative, you have come to us, binding us to yourself. Lord, work this truth into our hearts and minds that love's assurance would grow in us so that we can love those sitting right next to us, in front of us, behind us, in this sanctuary, those in our neighborhood, maybe those at work, when we'd rather not give them the time of day where we can go to them because you have come to us. Help us, great God of love. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.